think that the things we work on are really important, right? And, and certainly they are. Sometimes it's just a question of the scale and when they become important and significant. And it can be for lots of reasons. Maybe you just can continue to grow something over time. You have a bigger audience. You have more content on your website. <clears throat> or maybe there's a presidential election. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of things bring the work we do into different focus. Um, the Freedom of Information Act archive has the potential to be something even more interesting than we thought it was several months ago. And we're going to be able to share a bit of that with you today here. Um, as with many of you, we think this is something very, very special. But then again, doesn't everyone working on a digital initiative think it's something unique and very, very special? Of course they all are. But actually, they also have a ton of things in common. And you, you probably know that too. So in this case, the Freedom of Information Act archive, we think is a terrific example of a faculty-led project that has a lot of potential to grow in a lot of different ways, maybe even beyond the scholarly community. But it's reached that point. It's a point of transition. It's been out there. It launched over this last summer. And now it's going from a project to something we hope is much, much bigger. And it's going to face some challenges. And that's what we're going to talk with you about with you today. So in the session, I will stand away from the mic, but so you can see the presenters, we have folks from Columbia University, senior librarians, and also uh, a faculty member who created this. So you know, tonight, in, in the role of young, enthusiastic, <laughs> uh, idealistic librarian who wants to see a digital initiative succeed for the good of civilization and the digital humanities, <laughs> we have Barbara Hockenbach, the um, Associate University Librarian for Collections and Services. Tonight, playing the role of her somewhat cynical and jaded technology colleague, who has seen lots of projects like this, <laughs> we have Rob Cardellano, Vice President for Digital Programs and Technology Services. And finally, round, rounding out our cast is going to be uh, our leading man, uh, the hero of this quest for sustainability. Uh, we're going to travel him on this, on this path with him. And this is Matt Connolly, Professor of History at Columbia University. So uh, we hope to hear a lot from you after this presentation. We really are doing this as a way to share it with you and then to hear back, to get some feedback on what these next steps will be. So without, without further ado. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you all for joining us for this last session. As Nancy said, I'm Barbara, and I'm an, uh, the interim university librarian, or associate university librarian for collections and services at Columbia. Um, in about 2012, Professor Matt Connolly approached me. I was new, newly um, in the organization at Columbia as the director of the humanities and history libraries with a mandate to grow digital humanities. And um, Professor Connolly approached my team, the humanities team, about a data set that he needed for the first ever DH course, Digital Humanities course at Columbia called Hacking the Archive. It was a co-taught course with a professor in English and they needed a data set from the U.S. National Archives to, to really be sort of a pedagogical tool for this class in which they built something they called the Declassification Engine, which has now become the Freedom of Information Archive, or at least part of it, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. So when we heard from Professor Connolly, we thought, this is fantastic. We want to buy a collection that will be used in a course. Um, it's a new form of engagement for our our liaison librarians to be working with a faculty member in partnership to support a course and to really be pushing forward this this kind of new and emerging field of digital humanities. We were also really interested in it because it had a tie into the building of our um, our studio at Butler program. <coughs> the, our digital humanities librarian attended every single session of the Hacking the Archive course. It was in our um, then the, the Digital Humanities Center but also grew into some programming in our studio at Butler. So it really did sort of advance our program. Additionally, we um, were also able to see this project in alignment with university goals. Obviously, we're all looking to, to align with the, the largest strategic aims at universities that we're, we're working in. This, um, this particular project appeals very much to uh, the administration at Columbia. It's a, a university that cares a lot about First Amendment rights. You can see that here. Also, we have a provost that cares deeply about the Freedom of Information Act. So this particular engagement with a faculty member enabled us to align very closely with the university. And finally, 
as a library, we've always been committed to government information and to, um, to government documents. We're a federal depository library. We have always had a librarian dedicated to this work, or now our uh, government information librarian doing this kind of work. So it seemed natural that we began to think about what is government information in the 21st century. Something that uh, Professor Connolly really resonated with us was his, his really call to um, historians in training that you're not using paper archives as uh, you are to a certain degree, but there are new types of electronic archives that are bring brought to, being brought to bear on the kind of work that historians are doing, and we were very interested in all of that work. So why wouldn't we get involved in a project like this? <laughs> So like many of you who are dealing with uh, sustainable challenges in technology infrastructure, preservation storage, data management challenges, um, I've been dealing with dozens of legacy projects that over time have led to data silos, security issues, compatibility issues, performance issues, political challenges. Uh, while many of these projects are created internally, something I call a self-inflicted wound, um, some of them come from our faculty-driven projects that for some reason or another eventually land in the libraries. Uh, many of these projects share common characteristics. First, they lack clear ownership, governance, and funding. They might have had funding initially. They might have been grant-driven. They might have had a strong owner by the faculty member. But eventually, they wind up becoming the responsibility of somebody outside of the original owner. That typically is the library organization, sometimes it's the IT organization, and in my case, it's the library IT organization. So second, due to their age or implementation method, they typically have some level of technical issues, uh, and the IT organization in charge may need to divert scarce staffing resources or other resources to keep these systems running, to keep them from losing data or becoming a security issue. Sound familiar? Uh, third, there is typically some external pressure to keep these systems running without sufficient financial support, and as a result, this burden also falls upon the library and the library IT organization. These projects contribute to the te technical debt of our organization. They affect our ability to complete existing projects and to support the strategic efforts that our organization is setting forth for the organization to use technology to reshape our libraries to better serve our faculty and our students and our broader community. As a result, I've become a bit more sensitive about making upfront commitments that have long-term consequences for the libraries. And let's just take a look at one example. Um, Digital Dante uh, was a project that was created by a student uh, 22 years ago, uh, working with an Italian professor. And it was a fabulous project for its time. And uh, over time, it basically ran fallow. It was patched and uh, you know maybe a little bit of uh, electric tape and Elmer's glue by our teaching and learning uh, technology folks to keep it running. And eventually, thump, it landed uh, between Barbara and my respective areas. Um, luckily for us, we had the support of the chair. That faculty member now was the chair of the Italian department. And we undertook a two-year effort with the Italian department, with librarians in Barbara's team, with metadata specialists, with the technology folks, and we were able to renovate and restore this project, and it's now available. So this is a success story, but not without its cost. In doing this, unfunded mandate, with no additional resources, no strategic alignment to what the university wants us to do, we diverted resources that have an impact on us to solve all the problems. So while it's a success, <coughs> uh, it was not without its cost. Now maybe it might create an opportunity for us in the future, but that's the reality. That's just one project. There are probably 50 to 75 behind that that don't have the good fortune of a chair of the Italian department providing that support. So when I learned about this project from Barbara and Professor Connolly, my first reaction was perhaps typical of an administrator responsible for technology-related services um, and the infrastructure and the staffing that support them. Is this a project that will remain a faculty-driven project? Or should we consider this as a project that might one day find its home within the libraries or one of our partnership organizations? Is this project something that should be developed by a single institution? Or should we develop it aggressively as a consortial effort? Given that this is currently a custom programming, bespoke development effort, 
My secondary thoughts moved on to, well, how might we leverage some of the existing platforms like Hydra, Blacklight, Fedora, and whether these platforms might be relevant to these efforts. Now, that, that sounds great if you're from the library perspective, but I was also concerned about the balance between supporting a stable system and the need to innovate and experiment to support the type of scholarship and experimentation that Professor Connolly is, is doing uh, to advance the aims of his scholarship and the aims of this overall project. So, um, I looked at uh, three challenges. One, scale. How much data is stored today? What is expected to grow over time? How complex is this information? What type of metadata is used to manage it? You know, the, the nuts and bolts. From a software design perspective, how is it designed? Are there approaches that might help this project as it grows from a project to a sustainable service? Can we leverage any of the existing open source efforts that we have? And what are the development costs that we might have to put in place now? How might we reduce our local development efforts now and in the future? And how can we best help Professor Connolly in figuring this out? From a sustainability standpoint, what will it take to run this system over time? What financial commitment is required to run it and provide resources for innovation? If the project evolves to be a consortial effort, what type of governance should we have to, to ensure long-term success? And just going back to that slide, uh, when I put these up, these are not prescriptive of what we should do for the, the, the Freedom of Information Archive, but we see here there are consortial efforts around service development, consortial efforts around content development and management, and consortial efforts that really are about relationships. Any one of those three, or all three of those, could be formative for, for Professor Connolly's efforts. Um, so what I did to support begrudgingly, uh, uh, Barbara and, and Professor Connolly is assigned some of my team members, I, I joke begrudgingly, of course, <laughs> to support some of, uh, to, to assign some of my team members to work with uh, Professor Connolly's development staff to help us better understand the technical underpinnings, the data storages models, and the software design, and maybe even some of the, the data structures. And we use this information as input for the next stage of, of the process. Okay. All right. Um, let me just say, you know, first of all, that um, I'm one of your clueless, you know, faculty who just expects, you know, the books to be there and the, you know, the search engines to work. And you know, I, I before I started this project, I had no idea like the kind of effort that goes into that and the kind of tough choices um, that Rob and Nancy and, and Barbara face, you know, every day when people like me come to them and want even more. Um, so, so now I'm going to speak to. Uh, what I've learned along the way, and in uh, the ways in which I've tried to address, you know, some of those kinds of concerns, um, with a lot of help, as you'll see, um, and also how it is. I, I still think that there are real opportunities here, uh, not just for Columbia, but I hope you'll see how it is that that other institutions, you know, might see ways in which we might partner in this space and begin working together. Because I really do think the the issues, the underlying issues of government accountability, and how it is that we preserve a historical record, especially of our the record. Of of our time uh, is going to become even more important in future and ever more difficult, alas. All the more reason then we should, should work together on them. Um, so first of all, I, you know, often say, and it's true, that we are building, you know, the world's uh, largest database of declassified documents. Um, and what we're trying to do is not replicate what others have already done. Uh, there's wonderful work being done at the National Security Archive, for instance. You know, Document Cloud has many uh, terrific, um, you know, they have enormous numbers of declassified documents as well. But what we're trying to do is, is build an archive made for the age of electronic records uh, and build it that way from the ground up. And there are tremendous numbers of uh, not just digitized, but born digital declassified documents that are becoming available now. Every department and agency has to maintain a FOIA reading room. Right? And so those FOIA reading rooms represent an enormous um, you know, government commitment. And the government every year spends about $500 million uh, complying with FOIA in part by creating these electronic reading rooms to make those kinds of documents available to all of us. Um, so what we have, so far anyway, is a piece of it. Uh, but it's sizable and it's growing. Um, and this uh, shows you some of what we have so far, like the Foreign Relations of the United States from the State Department. Also, uh, though that also 
includes the records of every other agency and department that's involved in U.S. foreign relations, like Treasury, the Department of Defense, the CIA, and so on. Uh, the State Department's own Center for Foreign Policy files, and you'll see a few of the other collections here as well. And it's it's growing even as we speak. Uh, so we're now in the process of acquiring another half a million uh, records uh, from the Center for Foreign Policy files. Uh, the Foreign Relations United States is being produced uh, every year um, by act of Congress. The State Department is obliged to create the official record of American foreign relations. So now they have another, they still call them volumes and they still print them, but more and more these are uh, volumes that are being up, uploaded to GitHub. And so now there are 70 more of them in preparation, which amounts to about 30,000 uh, original documents. The Center for Foreign Policy files, as I mentioned, each year it's another half a million so uh, born digital records. The State Department began keeping electronic records in 1973. And when they first did an appraisal uh, in 2006, they found that there were already some 26 million records that had accumulated by that point. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, as I, I point out here, is that uh, these are textual records uh, for the most part. Like all the Center for Foreign Policy files are textual records. So all the data together you know, amounts to less than 100 gigs. So it's not actually a huge amount of data, even though uh, unfortunately the National Archives continues to throw out a lot of this data. Uh, they simply don't have the resources to process them and, uh, and provide them to researchers in the way they would like. Um, but what we can preserve is, is a lot, and what we are able to preserve then helps us to figure out what it is we're missing. What, what, what it is we're missing, as I'll show you in just a moment. Um, so this is something that I began working on. I was passionate about it. I was working with a statistics professor named David Madigan, though, and I had to because a lot of the data science work we wanted to do, I couldn't do on my own. Uh, we worked with a lot of students and professors, but especially students in computer science. And over time, we've been able to create this database, uh, a structured database with consistent metadata across these different collections, uh, such as to create a resource that will be of interest to multiple disciplines. And so the National Science Foundation doesn't actually fund history, um, only the history of science. So when we put in a, an application, we had to show how it is that this is a resource potentially for sociologists, for political scientists, and so on. Just one of those that I showed you, the Foreign Relations the United States, if you look at JSTOR, there are more than 2,000 articles in the political science literature referencing Foreign Relations the United States. So this is not just a repository for historians. Um, it's, it's one that could be of interest to other disciplines. And as I'll show you in a moment, that's not just in the social sciences and the humanities, but also data scientists themselves who are interested in, in this kind of structured data and want to work with it uh, and are beginning to work with it. Now, you may ask yourself, especially if one of us eventually comes to you asking for your help, you may ask yourself, why should we fund something where a lot of this is already online? Um, by definition, you know, what we're getting are, are things that are either digitized or born digital. Um, well, I could ask you, you know, why is it that we don't just dump all the books out in a big pile, right? And why is it that we create catalogs, you know? Why is it we create means of understanding the nature and content of these collections so that we can not just find the one thing we were looking for because we already had the title, but find the book to the right and the left, right? Um, and to create the kind of serendipity we have normally in a research uh, experience. That's the experience that's lacking when the only means of entry is through the search engine. And unfortunately, more and more of these collections, um, all you get is the search engine. And the search engine is just not good enough for the kind of research that faculty want to do. More and more of us, even the historians, want direct access to the data. You know, instead of having to go through this tiny keyhole that you get when you have uh, a search engine. And it's been proven, you know, from research that people do in the e-discovery field, you know, when lawyers, you know, have to deal with really large corpora, that when people are using keyword searching to try to find responsive documents for e-discovery for litigation, they only find about 20% of the relative, relevant records. Because the fact is, we don't know what the keywords are. Right? And in many cases, the things that we want are the ones that don't have that one keyword we were looking for. Um, now, the collections I was talking about, like this one, for instance, this is the search interface uh, for the Central Foreign Policy Files. What you have is a single search box. <clears throat> 
And you can do Boolean searching, you can do things like that. But if you want to do something that takes advantage of the tremendously rich metadata in these collections, the Center for Foreign Policy Files have 68 different fields of metadata. You know, like the classification level, what countries were concerned, what were the subjects of these records, even who reviewed them for declassification, so the review history and declassification. If you want to do any kind of searching involving that incredibly rich metadata, you have to search 28 different times, right? Because the only way you can do this kind of fielded search, you know, is through uh, a interface that only allows you to search one piece of it at a time. Um, the same story over at the State Department with the Foreign Relations United States collection. This is a tremendous collection. It's now about 500 volumes. It's more than 200,000 documents going all the way back to the Civil War. And the only way you can get access to that incredible collection is through the search engine. You know, it's as if you walked into the Library of Alexandria and said, I want all the scrolls that have the word Cleopatra in them, but not Antony. Right? I mean, who would do that? That's kind of a crazy way to do research. So, so I think what more and more of us want is to find a way of reproducing the experience of, of doing work in a proper library or a proper archive, you know, with finding aids. In some sense, when you find something, of the context and significance of what it is that you found. Um, so that's what we're trying to do uh, with this platform. And what I would argue is that, yes, it's true, a lot of this stuff is online, but it's scattered all over the place. And when you go look at any one of them, and all you have is that tiny keyhole, and you have to use it 28 times just to f search through one collection, it's really difficult to find what you're looking for, or to know what it is that you found when you find it. So what we're doing with our interface is allowing you to search through, uh, so far, these five different collections with more on the way uh, allow you to begin to begin with just to find the secret stuff if that's what you want um, but also to search by entity uh, and so what we mean by entity is we're leveraging the research done in data science called named entity recognition um, where you can search through a corpus and extract the names of a people places uh, organizations um, so you can use tools, not just off-the-shelf tools, but unfortunately you have to adapt them for using uh, historical corpora. Um, but in, when you do that, you begin to extract all the names of countries in these corpora. Like in this case, the countries mentioned in the Foreign Relations United States. You can extract the names of people. You can begin to see what's in that collection, which is what almost everyone wants to know when they're confronting something of that size. They want to know what's in there. What am I going to find if I start looking for it? And so you can begin combining these entities whether classification level, the names of countries, the names of peoples, and yes, you could do full word searching or full text searching as well. Um, this is an example of a tool that we built leveraging, again, research and data science, uh, a technique called topic modeling. And topic modeling is a probabilistic way in which you can cluster documents where you have the same kinds of words appearing in the same context. So in this case, um, when you run this algorithm, it will produce topics, and the most common topic is one with the words Israeli, Palestinian, oil, Egypt, PLO, etc. And so when you read those documents, and it will rank order them, you can tell that this is a document that's basically about Arab-Israeli relations. They use the same kind of technique to characterize as a corpus like all the articles published in science or nature and they use it to identify within that corpus which are the articles that are about genetics which are the ones about data science and they can use this to begin to see when does the topic of genomics begin to emerge in the life sciences and then they can trace kind of the rise and fall so we could do the same thing with other topics and it's a way of giving structure to what is otherwise an unstructured collection to begin to, again, reproduce what it is that all of us have come to hope and expect to find when we go to an archive. That is, to begin with, to have a finding aid, to have some sense of what's inside. Um, now, another tool we have is one that we borrowed, uh, with their permission, but from this, um, a tool that we borrowed from the people who created the Google Books and Gram Viewer, uh, but we're able to use it now uh, through Bookworm, um, through our collection. And you can search different archives, and so you can find, for instance, in this case, the rise and fall of human rights, right? And so there are historians who do this kind of work manually. 
There's a, a man named Sam Moyne who wrote a, a very well-known and controversial book called The Last uh, Utopia about the history of human rights who argued that as much as people think that the idea of human rights came from the UN Charter and the Holocaust, it actually was only in the late 60s and early 70s that people began to talk about human rights. He had to manually look up within several different newspapers you know, the numbers of times that somebody used that term human rights. And historians will do that kind of work because they know that for the history of ideas, sometimes Sometimes it's helpful just to know where those ideas come from and how they spread. Now you can do that at scale, you could do it with collections, you know, enormous collections, and you can begin to do multi-archival research by comparing whole archives one against another. Now when you, uh, all the tools on our website are there not just to produce pretty graphs and whatnot. You, you want to know what is the underlying nature of the data itself. So it allows you to find the documents that produce the data. Um, and once you, in this case, begin to click on the ones that produce that little burst in March of 1977, it not only retrieves that document um, that was the first one that helped produce that data point, but also it will allow you to see what other topics are represented within that document. And you can pivot from there to explore other related topics, topics related to the history of human rights. In this case, uh, Portugal's former colonies, relations with Ethiopia, etc. And it'll also, on the lower right, there's a tool called Merriam, uh, which is one we're using in uh, collaboration with an e-discovery firm, uh, where it's automatically generating similar documents. And you can calibrate or you can adjust the similarity like an old graphic equalizer if you want it to be more about the similarity in language or the similarity in countries or the similarity in people or the similarity in time. So you can find what was passing across the desk the same day that that particular document you were looking at. Um, so we're trying to reproduce the experience of archival research the way it was meant to be, as best we can with the tools we have from data science. So the last thing I want to address um, Rob's concern about sustainability, because I know it's, it's something everybody has to be concerned about. And normally we just think about sustainability in terms of money, like where's the money going to come from? Um, but what I would like to suggest is that sustainability ultimately, whether it's money or talent, you know, the talented people you have to recruit to work on this stuff, it comes from the intrinsic importance of what it is you're working on. The material itself, is it important enough? Well, I've been trying to show whether it's through, you know, acts of Congress, you know, or whether it's, it's through the other ways in which the government identifies, or the people as a whole, you know, identify the things that we have to care about and preserve. I would argue that the, the archive, you know, of America and the world is something that we all have to care about, you know, now as, as much as ever. Um, so that it's not just the historians. So the, the data that we're collecting is now being used by computer scientists, uh, whether at Princeton or at Microsoft, in, the, in this case, in uh, creating a tool to automatically detect historical events. Um, it's something also um, that a professor at MIT working in statistics found useful for developing new models to find burstiness, to do traffic analysis, the same kind of research the NSA is doing, but now we're able to do on, a, on American declassified documents. This was something also of interest to the general public, right? So BuzzFeed will write about a feature about art research like this when they think that it's something that many people will find interesting. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, I think, this is the kind of research and this is the kind of collection that's going to begin to help us understand what it is we're missing. What it is that's not there. What's not being preserved because it's being destroyed. Or what's not being shown to us because it's still classified. It's still being kept secret. So with this kind of data, with this, these kinds of tools, you can begin to make out the, the dark matter <laughs> in this universe. You can begin to see what it is the government is classifying and what it is it's more likely that you're not likely to see in the historical record. And so this is some research that I wrote about uh, recently with one of my students for the Washington Post, you know, and applying these kinds of algorithms to the problem of a machine classification of state secrets. In this case, to show how much human error there is in the way that we identify things as secret or not secret. But however you count it, and this is from government statistics, the Information Security Oversight Office produces statistics every year on how many secrets the government is generating. There's enormous numbers of uh, not just documents anymore, of course, but more and more electronic records, right? That's where you see the inflection point. When they begin to count things like email and text messages and so on, you see enormous amounts of classified data. It's growing all the time, but the amount of documents that are being reviewed and released to the public is declining. And in fact, since the late 1990s, there's been a collapse 
basically. And now we're still, even in 2015, there's only about 30 million pages of documents that are being released every year. Because it's basically, and here we do come back to money, it's really about the money. The nation's budget for keeping official secrets is over $15 billion. So this graph is from back in, or it was only up until fiscal 2011. We're now at $15 billion the government is spending on keeping secrets, right? The things that they, they think are too dangerous for the rest of us to look at. Take a look at that tiny sliver at the bottom, right? There was a little blip in the late 1990s, right? Since then, adjusted for inflation, the, the amount of money the government is spending on declassification is 15% what it was in the late 1990s. It is less than 1% of what the government spends on guarding state secrets, right? So that's the government's uh, priority, right? That should not be our, the way that we understand what our resources um, should be paying for, or what our priorities ought to be as a republic, right? Especially in this time. So, so these are the arguments that I would make about why it is, I think, this is something that people should care about, and I'm hoping anyway that we're going to find partners, maybe even partners in this room. So I'll turn things over to Nancy. Sorry, what's Just, that? So the slide shows the... Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I'll tell you really quickly, because I really didn't want to make sure there's time for questions here, but I'm actually not with Columbia. I am the hired guy. I'm a consultant at Columbia. He's invited in. Um, my firm is called Blue Sky to Blueprint. And I love projects like this, because I think the trick is figuring out, as, as Matt mentioned, it's, it's a financial question at the end of the day, because some folks will have to get paid to do some work. But it's a lot of other dynamics that involved as well in terms of making this something that a lot of people buy into to use, to participate in, and so forth. So I'll share a tiny bit of research we just completed in September, October. I interviewed some stakeholders at uh, Columbia and um, deans of libraries around the country, just a handful, um, and faculty, mostly in history and, and some social sciences, to get a sense of just from looking at it, they took a glance at the, at the project that just as it had been launched, they read a two-pager, and then they started to give some first impressions about what it could be and where it could go. So obviously everyone loved it, but it was a little bit like the blind men describing the elephant. Right? Someone said, oh, this is great. This would be great if it had, I should go for a huge amount of content. Someone said, oh, this would be only great if I could download the data sets. I, I never want to use the website. And it went on like that. People had a tremendous variety of responses. Not so helpful, but important to know. Important to know that part of our task is shaping. There was a big disciplinary divide in how people used it. Matt suggested historians and social scientists or those in the humanities and social sciences, but it's really methodological, not disciplinary. It's, is, does your question involve needing to read a document or does your question involve needing to churn through data looking for patterns? And the split was very stark. Different people doing it different ways wanted the information different ways. Historians doing very sophisticated work didn't necessarily want to build their own analysis tools. They very much wanted to use it on a site they just wanted to get to the material. Uh, folks more comfortable with computation said, I'm sure your tools are nice, I'm gonna write my own. <laughs> and that, was, that split was very clear. The other big message was a uh, little tension here. <coughs> you have to go big, this has to be huge. You know, What slice do you have? You, the numbers look big, but what part of the whole does that represent and how quickly could you get to the whole? And how can you talk about what that whole is? But don't try to do everything. <laughs> right, so, so how do we figure what that, what that's gonna look like? And then finally, um, everyone is very impressed by the work, especially since it's been done really by a skeleton crew. But here's that point. How do you take it from something that's identified with a person in the university and have the entire community, whatever, however we choose to define that, buy in so that everyone feels real ownership of this? So we can go to the next slide. Sure. I'll just kind of nuance what some of these issues are and then we'll open it up. So that content roadmap is tricky. Um, there was a 25 agencies are creating these materials that get classified and then get declassified, and there's different time frames and there's different processes for the declassification, and then maybe some stuff is just more interesting than other stuff. So how do we figure out what that's going to look like and how quickly to get there? Um, there were a lot of different ideas on this, but actually each different scholar I spoke with has their own personal project. <laughs> What was an interesting idea I'll just launch out there was possibly there would become some kind of a community of people who helps to influence not just what gets put here, but possibly what the government declassifies. All of a sudden, that started to sound like an area we might look into some more. Um, overall, um, this next phase certainly has to involve some degree of really sharpening up how we talk about this. I mean, Matt does such a great job of talking about what the richness of it is, 
But again, how can we talk about what the future of it looks like? Are we going to aim for real innovation in the research tools? Are we going to aim for real growth and a certain path on the content? What's going to be the investment? If people do come in, how do we encourage them to you know, support that the, the strategy that, uh, that, the, that the team will devise? And then finally, you know, how do you actually get people involved? I mean, that's like the age-old question. There seems to be an inherent interest and fascination in this, but this is going to be a real work of outreach. What, which elements will respond to people? How broad is that disciplinary uptake going to be? How do you explain to a scholar of English that actually there's probably stuff in there that they're interested in too, depending on who they're studying? So there's going to be a lot of things around that. And finally, funding model. At the end of the day, it's going to actually cost something to do this. Um, no matter how clever the cost avoidance strategies are, there, there's going to be something that's going to have to be covered, uh, especially as these guys know very, very well. So I will also just suggest, just because it made me chuckle, literally everyone I spoke with, I would just say, so how do you think, what feels like the right kind of a model for something like this? I heard everything from advertising, corporate sponsorship, <laughs> to like uh, other more traditional things like partnerships and, and building a consortium. Uh, I've never had a project where literally I could check a box and every, you know, every single box was checked, um, <laughs> different models that people felt could possibly work. So we've got a lot of work to do. At this point, I'll open it up to you. Would love to hear what, what pieces of this really respond and really resonate with you. Also, uh, if you want to check it out, I don't know if uh, the connection here is any good, but um, if you have a decent internet connection, it's at history-lab.org.